On behalf of the Carlson School and the University of Minnesota, I'm thrilled to welcome all of you joining us in person back to campus. Give yourselves another round of applause for just being here. And for those of you who are joining us in person, you're welcome to remove your masks while you are eating or drinking, but we'd appreciate you putting them back on if you're not when you, once you're done. And, but, uh, you know, the, the, as many of you know, the first Tuesday is the longest running business gathering in Minnesota. And the po pandemic certainly didn't stop our m momentum at all. We've had 16 phenomenal speakers during this year and a half when we were not in person. And they've presented to thousands of people in our audience, all while leading their organizations and communities through this very, very challenging time. So we're really very, very thankful to those who made sharing their knowledge and insights with our community such a priority. And I have to say, while the last year and a half pushed us online, it also opened up this huge new opportunity. It greatly expanded this gathering to include the Carlson School's global community. And today is again the first time we are streaming our in-person event to a worldwide audience. So again, to the hundreds joining us online today, warmly welcome all of you, and we hope that you will stay with us as we continue this hybrid process. We also hope that you will all be able to return to campus at some point, and you know, soon, hopefully, to you know, connect in person with your colleagues and to hear from our speakers uh, directly. But we're still so very pleased that you can be part of this gathering, whether you're here or whether you're online. And before we move on to our program, I'd like to recognize Regent Farnsworth, who's attending today. Thank you. Please also join me in thanking the sponsors who have rolled out the red carpet today, the McNamara Alumni Center. It's great to be back. And D'Amico Catering and as well as our long-standing corporate and media sponsors who continued their support as we gathered virtually over the last year and a half, and they are Wells Fargo and Twin Cities Business. So please join me in a round of applause for our sponsors. Today we are joined by our featured speaker, Bill McGuire, for a presentation about his leadership endeavors with Minnesota United and there will be time for audience Q&A, both from our physical audience as well as from our online audience. Bill is the lead owner of Minnesota United and has been instrumental in building this club into a very successful and cherished soccer franchise in our community. He was also critical gathering community support and investment in the club and brought together a truly illustrious group of founding owners, some of whom include Glenn Taylor, who's been an owner of the Timberwolves and Lynx, the Pollard family, owners of the Twins, and our school's dear friend, Wendy Nelson, who's chairwoman of the Carlson Family Foundation and a member of the Carlson Company Board, as well as, of course, the Board of Advisors of the Carlson School of Management. So it's great to have all of you involved in this. Bill originally purchased the Lower Division Minnesota Stars in 2012, which had been planned for closure and after rebranding and rebuilding the team, he was awarded an MLS franchise in 2015. The club began playing in the National Division MLS in 2017, then opened Allianz Field, which is this beautiful space, in 2019. The team plays to sell out crowds and rose to the league semifinals in 2020 in only its fourth year of play. Bill was also formerly the chairman and CEO of United Health Group and received his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. Bill and his family are year-round residents of the Twin Cities and active supporters of education, the arts, healthcare, medical research, and conservation. So everyone, please welcome Bill McGuire as he begins his presentation. Thank you, sir. Thanks. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I think I always have the misfortune of following someone with great energy and 
and enthusiasm when we, we talk. And, uh, but it's a, it's a great to be here, and uh, thank you all for sharing the afternoon with us. Um, this is uh, a bit of a rambling story we're going to take, because I'm not one that thinks that anybody likes to sit around and look at some uh, slides, that spreadsheets, and other things that you might think of with uh, business. Um, so instead, we're going to talk about the intersection of business and other things, really, about society and, and being better, perhaps. And to do that, focus on a story uh, that had to start somewhere. Uh, soccer maybe started hundreds of years, thousands plus years ago. Uh, but we're going to start this one in, I think, 1966. And... <clears throat> sort of said shaping the future and a lot in life I think as we grow older we realize is serendipity you don't necessarily plan on where you're going or how it's going to happen and you don't know science is certainly that way a lot of the medical research and the great discoveries are uh, accidental or incidental to other kind of research but in 1966 um, I was growing up in Texas and had the good fortune of going to a fairly small school halfway between Houston and Galveston, and it was a basketball school. So I was playing basketball at a well-known school for that in a state where it was called King Football. And it was so bad that if you were playing basketball, you actually didn't get to practice as a basketball team until the football season was over because they were afraid you'd get an advantage over the football players. Um, <clears throat> but we were good, and that year, 1966, I ended up playing in the state championship. Um, the guy that was on the other team, uh, their star, so to speak, uh, and I played to an uh, overtime match in which they won, and uh, that was the first piece of serendipity, because later that summer, he and I were roommates on the so-called North-South All-Star basketball team. And that's important because of two things. His girlfriend at the time is now my wife, and that's when we met all those years ago, 1966. The second thing is that I had the good fortune of listening to the man whose picture you see here. Uh, many of you may recognize him, John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood, coach. Um, and I would say that next to him is this thing called the pyramid of success in which there are so many nuggets into this one little thing you have to get a microscope out to look at it. But he was extraordinary. And the messages he taught about what you needed to do and think about were always there. This is a man in that time had 10 out of 12 years he was NCAA champion at UCLA with all kinds of teams. Short guys, tall guys, black players, white players, as divergent as Lou Alcindor, later Kareem Abdul, uh, and another guy named Walton, who followed the Grateful Dead around. And he was extraordinary. And listening to him talk, he had all these sayings and these lessons you know, whatever you do in life, surround your, with yourself with people you can argue with. Forget about yesterday, it's gone. Today's what counts and in the future. Do something for other people. These are things that are extraordinary. And I think they always impacted me and I, I probably didn't realize it at the time, but you carry that stuff with you. And it was also one of those times which you realized that sports means a lot and you learn a lot from sports that you otherwise can't get in life. And that's why it is so fundamentally important to a lot of people, and should be, and should be supported. The other thing that happened that year is depicted in this video I'm gonna show you. I think. This is from the movie Glory Road was 1966 and Texas Western won the National All Basketball Championship, Don Haskins. He put out five players, they were all black, first time it had ever happened. 
and this is from the end of the movie when they're getting off and you sort of see the differences and what did these people do and where did they go. Don Haskins used to say, and I think he actually wrote in his book about this, that it was never planned. There wasn't a mission here about promoting something. His plan was to win and he put the best five out that he could and he beat Adolph Ruff's nationally first ranked team that year. So the lesson was he put out the best people and he gave opportunity to people and the sport provided that opportunity. And so I think those things stick around and hear a train coming, people get ready. Great Curtis Mayfield song with Alicia Keys singing it. Great movie, worth watching. So the other beginning then is really 2012. And that's probably the first time I saw a soccer match and it was up at the NSC National Sports Center, which Governor Purchase had, Purpich had the wisdom to start many years ago. And the Minnesota Stars were about to be folded by the league and they were trying to find somebody to buy them. And I went up there and watched and they won the game and 300 fans maybe, and they broke the fence down. And I said, these people are crazy. What, what is it about this sport? And so I thought about it and I said, well, look at our demographics, young, changing. We want to be an international community. How do we be an international community without the world's game being there? And is it really the world's game? What is it? So I went and looked a little more. This is my due diligence at the time, because there wasn't anything to do due diligence on, and that's the business lesson. Don't ever buy something that you don't do due diligence on. Emotion is a, not a good thing. This is... This is, this is part of Casablanca, their team that nobody ever heard about in the movie. These people are just nuts. And I looked at this and so I looked somewhere else and said, well, what else? Well, this is Argentina, Buenos Aires, the legendary club. Look at these people. This is their life. They're going crazy. They start lighting flares. At our games, my wife hates the smoke. She says, ah, oh, smoke. Look at this. Look at the guys climbing. They got a 20 foot chain leak fence around the field to keep the people away from the players. This is where our player, Emmanuel Reynosa came from. That's his world. And then we looked over in England and the absolute best beginning of any game. What's amazing about this, and all these red scarves, is you have 90,000 people singing, you'll never walk alone. The theme song or the song for Liverpool. And you know what's crazy? These 90,000 people are in Melbourne watching Liverpool play a game there. This isn't even their home craft. You say, folks, there's something here. It's the world's game for a reason. And that sort of clinched it. So I said, sure. Like the scene from Trading Places, I gave the league $1. That's what the team cost, one dollar. He said, great. Two years later, we have a bunch of fans and we're 12 million dollars in the hole. There's that due diligence problem. But it's emotion, it's serendipity, it's something else. Here we go. So we started out and said, what do we need to do? So here's the business side, what are we going to do? We have to just survive, we have to stabilize, we have to get a few partners, that'll step in, a few local people, come to some of them in a minute, stepped in. We had to create awareness 
and we wanted to establish a brand because it can't be this crazy everywhere in the world about this sport and not be that way here. It's got to be. There's something about it. There's something about what it means. And that's how this started in the beginning. So we established a brand, which we released in 2013, when we started um, as Minnesota United. This was designed uh, locally here. And you can see we have what some say is the loon. I always thought it was a schematized Phoenix rising. But we have La Toile de Nord, the Star of the North. You've got the river, you've got the Iron Range. You've got all the elements for the badge. And in our first year, this was ranked the number 12 best soccer badge in the world because of what it portrayed. So we survived, we moved on. It's easy when your cash flow consuming rather than producing, you just write more checks. And along came Major League Soccer, the big guys. And we said, ah, now this is, this is Armageddon here. We either have to commit and jump up or we're gonna be out of business because we're not gonna compete. You know, somebody's going to bring Lionel Messi or somebody to town, and that's where everybody's going to go. So we put a group together. We had to decide what our goal was. We had to say, can we put some people together um, to fund it, to jump it up? You know, capitalize it. We needed to build a stadium. We needed to get competitive. All the things that you have to be. And understand that soccer in America at this time is not the NFL or MLB or the NBA. Guys out there in media land are not writing you, you know, 11 figure checks and mailing them in just because you're showing up. Um, you're writing them checks for the privilege of having your team on the screen. But we started working on doing this and set about it and we put the ownership group and some of those were mentioned but you know what was important here again going back to the beginning this isn't like a, a business this isn't we're going to do a business first this is we're going to do something that makes a difference and should make a difference and if we do it well somehow the business side will find its way to us and that's what happened so I put up an analogy because United Health is oftentimes mentioned. I think the thing that made United Health what it is today, beyond just a lot of really good, dedicated people working their butt off all these years and keeping looking forward, was stepping back and not being a product, not saying as it was in 1985 or 89 when it was basically bankrupt. Um, we're an insurance company, we're an HMO company, we're about making a widget and it's called an HMO. You got to aspire to something bigger and I think the really great companies do that. They step up. So in this case, the aspiration is really to improve the health and well-being of people and to do that by organizing the greatest resources in the world in healthcare, even if they're at times inappropriately used and overpriced but organizing those so they meet the needs of human beings and communities and not define yourself in a narrow product line just yet. And that's where that began. So when we sat back and said, okay, what are we gonna do for this team, for the soccer club? There was certainly a goal of having a professional team that was very good at what it does. But underneath that was the bigger thing of reinforcing and bringing to bear what soccer is, what soccer stands for, what it means for people as a sport. Remember, this is a sport that everybody plays around the world. It doesn't cost anything. You know, around the world, there aren't camps for kids where your parents spend $5,000 a year for the privilege of playing. They just play and they play with unbridled joy 
and enthusiasm. And they play regardless of age, sex, race, whatever orientation you want. They just play. And they are part of the community that they come from. And that's what we needed to do. So that's where we really started out and said, this is what we're gonna go after. So among the ways we're gonna do that, we were gonna play in MLS, which meant we had to convince Major League Soccer that they wanted to be in Minneapolis. And that was actually the easiest thing because they did want to be here. They know what the community is. They know about all the great um, corporations here and stuff. We had to commit or convince them that they wanted to be with us instead of playing in the stadium, wherever it is, down the road. Not this one, but U.S. Bank Stadium. Playing on real grass in a stadium that was dedicated to the sport that so many people care about, not having a team that was just going to be a tenant in somebody else's building. And we set off on those things, promote the brand, do all the stuff that you understand. And we furthermore really focused on how can we be part of the community. We need to be part of the community. Bring these lessons to bear and they'll come back to benefit us. So we started on the stadium. <coughs> And here it needed to be outdoors because where do you have better weather almost all of the year than Minnesota? It's true. In five years, we have now played, we have had two games where it got snowed on, including the famous snow game right across the street with 35 or 40,000 people. Um, <clears throat> we've never been rained out. We've never even had a rain interruption. There's no other team in the country that can give you that record. So we wanted it outdoors. We wanted it on real grass, environmentally friendly real glass, not fake stuff that's plastic. We wanted to build it without taxpayer money because some of us actually believe that's not where taxpayer money should go. And we set off to do this. We wanted to inspire a neighborhood wherever it was and transform a neighborhood. So we started looking around in this parable, I think many of you have heard. The first place we were going was downtown Minneapolis. And this shows you, I don't think I can, won't highlight it, but right what's, you know, the farmer's market area. And we were looking for things like rapid transit and alternate transit programs because we wanted everybody to be able to get there, convenient for all people. You didn't have to have a car. And this was a great spot. We wanted it to be able to transform the neighborhood. This was a great spot. There wasn't anything going on there. It needed to be transformed. And we wanted to utilize existing resources if they were available, and they were here. This is what we designed. Um, stadium, you could see back, you can see the, the uh, farmer market buildings there, sort of the same kind of roof line. This was the beginning of this flow idea. And sometimes we get carried away, or some of us do. And you can see I built a bridge, or we designed a bridge across I-94 to connect North Minneapolis to downtown with a great lawn. This, this was extraordinary. What could be better? A free stadium bringing the world's game to downtown in revitalizing the area, somebody else pays for it. Sorry, we missed something. You're not welcome here. So we looked around some more and we went to the Mall of America and the Gourmetians said, hey, we got this land right on the east side of the mall. And we looked at this and it was pretty good too because the light rail came right down and we designed the stadium there, as you can see, and it looked like this continuing this flow drawing or idea with even a covered area going right over to the mall for easy shopping. Um, would have been great. Um, we were concerned, however, that it was on the edge of a flight runway and that some people that might not want us here would lobby enough that that would never get approved and we would be stuck so we couldn't go there. So. Mayor Coleman, Chris Coleman said, come to St. Paul. And we saw this scenic spot. Um, 
once called a war zone, I think, maybe still is, but this is the bus barn property. Imagine, this is the busiest corner in the Twin Cities, I-94 and Snelling, and that's what we had to look at for the last 50 years. Seemed like it was okay. So we laid out a plan and using the, the 10 acres that was the bus barn, we designed a stadium. This was the beginning and put some buildings around it and say, hey, this could work. We'll transform the area, grow, do all of this stuff. And that's where we ended up. And you can see it's about six miles from St. Paul. It's about six miles from Minneapolis. It's about 14 miles from the Mall of, Amer or the Mall of America. And it's about seven or eight miles from the airport. Centrally located, light rail already invested in and existing, bus, bikes, the whole works. A great location. Drew our renders, look like this, like this, and we started building. And the first step of what can we do to help a neighborhood started taking place. And this was before the end, but the takeaway on this slide is about 155 million or so dollars was spent on just the construction and the workers. The workers received $46 million in wages from us for this. The average wage was 33, or the low end of the wage was $33 per hour. This is just the people working on it. So that kind of money put into that. Very diverse work group, 40 plus percent uh, minorities. We had small business ownership, women owned business, minority owned business. It was a huge success. And what we got out of it was this. So if you just need a refresher, there you were. And here we are. So I, I think that part of it became pretty obvious of building something that would make a difference. And importantly, something that people could aspire to, be proud of, because the whole world looked up and said, St. Paul, look at this. This stadium's known all over the place because it has features like that. So we move forward a couple of years getting started and here we are now. And I'm gonna call this phase three because we've obviously built some relationships. Um, the one thing we haven't figured out how to do is make money yet, but hopefully that'll come. But what's important about that is that the people that are supporting this club, both the people that show up to watch the games, the people that care about the players, the sponsors who are our partners, who put their name here. Remember I talked early on about, it's really a family. Those people and the owners care about what's happening and they put that first. The rest of it will follow. And so now we're at 2022 going on and we're gonna work a little more on the business stuff. You know, get at the revenue, get what I call a button down business that really is efficient and responds. Get out there, we need our team to continue to evolve and do better. Um, put this one up, we need something that's made out of metal. You know, something that you can put in the, hang on the wall or put in that, big rack and let people stare out. Those are our objectives. And then we've got a few more we'll come to. So here's how this is gonna happen. Sitting right down here. She put her mask on to hide. Um, one of the more accomplished executives that I've ever met in one of the, in short, time of knowing her, one of the best people I've met. Not a soccer person. Passionate about sports, more passionate about opportunity, and cares a hell of a lot about our community. So what else can you ask for? So we're going on. We got some principles that we've laid out. Um, they're the ones you know. They're about brand. Brand is everything. You've got to stand for something and you've got to consistently believe it and support it and show it. 
You've got to act it. You don't have to advertise it. I hate virtue signaling. What these people do, it comes from the heart. It starts there. Just like those guys climbing off that airplane. That's really it. And so that's one of the things we're after the team. We want the stadium experience to be better than, and it's hard to be a lot better than it is, frankly. It's pretty great, but we want to keep it there and help it be better. We want our partners to be proud to be with us, and we want to be proud to have the partners we have. You know, we want to have great business management. We want to understand that, you know, we are a capital consuming business, and to get capital to pay for that, we have to return on capital. So we have to have the business disciplines that are important to any business, even this. We need great people that are balanced and care, want to be part of this, and we need to produce a culture that is reflective of the beliefs that soccer has, where we started back in the beginning, those things that are going on all around the world. And that isn't to say there isn't some bad stuff. There's bad stuff everywhere. But the fundamental reason that people are so passionate, and you just go home and turn on YouTube and start looking at supporter groups around the world, and you are just blown away what the sport, because people can relate to it. It's theirs, and that's what sport is. So the last thing is the community. And that's, we've just talked about that, extending out, but there's also some things to do. And one of the things is we started with this 35 acre site, 25 of it is owned by somebody else, but we've um, been able to work some things out and plan a building and a program to do something there. So the 25 acres, however, with cutting roads through and doing right of ways and property setbacks, we have 10 to build. And the idea is live, work, play. Make this a place that people want to live, where people want to go, where people want to play. Every day, not just on game day. Make it a community that we're proud of. Move on from this. Originally moved to this. This was the master plan in 2016. You know, a lot of density, not maybe the best big buildings, but it was a start. It had elements, you know, 350,000 square feet of office space, 600,000 uh, square feet of apartments and this kind of stuff. Retail, um, had a great big tall sculpture we wanted to bring in uh, by a gentleman named Bernard Benet, who's 80 year old Frenchman and maybe arguably the, the most famous major outdoor sculpture person in the world right now. Um, he came over three times, designed something. It was going to be the, um, actually the largest sculpture in um, the Western Hemisphere, bigger than the Statue of Liberty. And I said, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. You always got to fight for something. What do we want? Something that will actually attract people to come here? Yeah. So we started with that. About a couple years ago, this time, Tom Fisher, who many of you know from this university, wrote an opinion piece in the paper and he talked about density because everybody said you got to be dense. And he really started talking about, you know, fine grain density, where you can walk, where you can play, you can, how to design it, not just big buildings. And so since then we started looking at this and this is a refinement of the original master plan that starts making buildings smaller, putting in mews between buildings so you can walk. These are all among the myriads of plans that we've since done. And this we is not the team per se, although the team helps push and, and argue for this. Walkability, trees, probably 600 trees like we have around the stadium now, open space, green space. Um, retail buildings like this, all small, first floor, um, so people want to come there. And if you are a business person and you have a small business, you don't need cheap rent alone. 
you need people coming in the door to buy your product so you can pay your rent and you can do something. And that was the design here of all of this. So big, big shops aren't there. Here's one of the first buildings. This one's actually funded. It's about $85 million. It's 240 apartments right on Snelling. And its biggest characteristic to me is it's got some architectural integrity and doesn't look like East Berlin architecture that seems to be the mode today for most apartment buildings. Um, I don't know if this building's gonna go up. People that have committed to it are committing to it because among other things, they want this community to be great. They wanna help it. And so they'll take a little less on the return. And we'll see. 3% rent control today in the ballot. If it passes, this won't happen because they can't invest that kind of money um, under that uncertainty. Private individual might, but they won't. But this is the kind of notion. Here's the mu I talked about. So instead of a building occupying a big thing, you cut it, you make space in between. You can see the building actually on the left where uh, the outside wall says united by everyone. That's uh, another corporate partner here who wants to fund that building for 30 million or so. And it's an incubator office space on two or three floors for small business incubators. And the first floor is a restaurant or food area, which could be called something like passport not required. Here's a building on the lawn. If you're over there and you see that big lawn, this was out there. And the big thing about this is it could occupy or hold a 40 by 25 foot outdoor video screen. So every night you can put videos up there just like this down at Wrigley Field or in Miami or in Europe. So you have movie night, you have sport night, you have opera night, you have whatever you want. A way to make this a community asset. That's really what this space is about. Art, top mural, these are 120 feet long. The Kumba Aiken in situ, um, Jones did that. And down below is Cobra, the international artist from Brazil, um, depicting the continents and mother and, father and child from different cultures and different continents. He also, I think, some of you may recognize the style, but he did the Bob Dylan building downtown. Tremendous, tremendous. So this kind of thing. And again, a community united by everyone. So where are we? Where are we today? Where are we gonna go? Hopefully this, soccer a metaphor for a better society, bringing the things. Our choices are really these. Do we want vitality? you know, pride, thoughtful change, or just live in the past, take what we've been. Do we want to control who we are or just take what comes? Do we want to be a better society or accept less than we can be? Remember John Wooden. Success is making sure that you've done all you can to be who you could be. This is the starting 11 from a recent game. And I throw it up there on the front row left is a Will Trap from Columbus. Next to him, Reynosa and Fragapani from Argentina, down where Boca was. Next to them is Ozzy Alonso, who in 2007 in Houston playing a soccer game for Cuba walked off with the shirt on his back and defected. Ethan Finley, Duluth, in the back row, goalkeeper. Tyler Miller, New Jersey. Next to him, Robin Lude from Finland. Next to him, Michael Boxall, New Zealand. Chase Gasper from Oregon. Metonair. And Ibaki, you know, Mali, Madagascar. Look at that. That's the UN. That's sports. That's soccer. No other issues there. 
more recently, a few nights ago, U.S. Women's National Team. <laughs> a couple people here. Luminaries from our Twin Cities. Last game of Kari Lloyd. Great, great player. A different kind of pride and representation of opportunity in all of this. It's soccer in this great, beautiful stadium. Point out again, real grass. This is a sculpture that went up last month. It's by a guy named Jim Sanborn. Um, probably best known for his first sculpture of this type, which is at the CIA headquarters. And it's part of one of the um, Dan Brown books, The Lost Symbol. And it's about Cypher. But in this case, around those 18 panels are 18 times in the history of soccer going back to 600 BC or whatever we call it now. And he has picked it, he's chosen on his own certain events and those events relate to values. And so if we started at the bottom, we would see something like um, competition and go up, we see patience and then we go up and we see equality and we see diversity and we see opportunity. And then 18 of those, all representing what soccer is. Except in this case, each 18 is depicted on a panel in 42 different languages. It's really quite extraordinary. You can see how it then reflects at night here. And this is one of my all time favorite videos. The first year after we had won a game at the new stadium and one of our supporters tweeted this out, I guess, and we won't be able to hear it, but it's he and his daughter. She's singing Wonderwall, riding home in St. Paul on her bike, singing Wonderwall. So when we say, where are we? Here's our world. It too is on the YouTube, just like all those others. So I, I think we can say we're getting there. Getting there. And that's really what the journey is. What's the story? Um, how it happens. It's a great sport for people, representative, or representing what we want to be, what we can be, what we aspire to be, what we hopefully will be in a great city, a great community, um, a lot of people contributing. And so when we look at this, we can all decide what does united really mean to us. It doesn't mean just one thing, but that really is the story. So thank you all. Appreciate it. But again, I'm glad to see everyone with their masks back on after, after the meal. But uh, we will have questions. Amy, do you want to take turns between? Yes, okay. we have our first question back here, and then we've got a ton coming in from our virtual audience as well. So we'll try to go back and forth here while we have the last five to seven minutes. Dr. McGuire, I got my mask off while I'm talking to you. I hope that's OK. Um, it's been about a year and a half since I've done this, so here it goes. I have a lot of comments about the United. Number one is you had Chris Wright who played for the Minnesota Kicks in the 1970s and ran the Timberwolves. That, I think that was a great asset. You got shown an Aspire commercial, which is pretty good marketing. But the one thing I don't think you alluded to is that to put the stadium in, you had to do a lot of, a lot of developmental construction uh, on where the stadium is. And could you talk about uh, what a risk factor that might be? And I think you're going to come out all right. I think you need to get a media television sponsor maybe, but I think you're going to come out all right. Win, win one championship and Minnesota will be there. Minnesota will be there anyway, so don't give up the ghost just yet. So the, the question is the, the struggle to get a stadium or? You, uh, in order to get that new stadium in place where it is, you had to take a lot of, I think, construction and developmental risk 
to move some business, pretty well established businesses out to get your stadium in. Well, um, there was that's a pretty big risk factor, but I think you came out okay. Would you like to allude on that, or is that something we shouldn't touch? No, we, you know, as I said, the the, the uh, site is 35 acres called the bus barn at the Midway site. 25 acres surrounding and an L is owned by RD management, Rick Beardoff in New York. He's owned it for 30 some years. It was some big boxes and some smaller businesses, none doing particularly well. Several of the big ones were um, probably ready to leave. Cub Foods, for instance, I mean Rainbow at the time. They, so Rick had leases. We had to buy those leases out. We put down a lot of money um, to make this happen because these were revenue producing businesses for Rick. And so, <clears throat> you know, it wasn't like you can buy a piece of land. So as I tell people, the difference between something like a development um, outside of town, uh, Ryan's doing, for instance, where I don't know what the cost was, but maybe 80 or or $100,000 an acre, this land, when you factor it in and you look at what you're now building, is four and a half million dollars an acre. So part of the risk is buying the land to do it, um, to then build on, because now you've got an expensive basis to build. There were some environmental risks there. We, we had to pay for those. The St. Paul Port Authority was very good in helping at that. And uh, and it was just a matter of, of putting it there. I don't think there was ever any doubt that, you know, it was one of, it, it was, if, if we build it, they will come in the first year. Um, but we needed to make sure that the experience was extraordinary. That people said, this is great. This is a good way to spend my two hours. And we still have to keep doing that and, uh, and developing. But I think, you know, net net at five years, by almost every measure. Very good, very good. All right, we've got a question from our virtual audience, Katie. Yes, Chelsea um, is asking, what is the best lesson you have learned from your journey with the Minnesota United Football Club? <laughs> the best lesson that I have learned. I'm probably not a one lesson person. Um, um, I adamantly believe that my, or, or think that it has been supported that if you set off to do something that has value for people, has meaning for people, it will turn out okay. Um, we can assign different measures of what is okay, um, but I, I think there's no escaping the fact that through this, through that initial time, thinking back all the way to 1976 when we had our first pro team here, the kicks and the ups and downs for all those years and none of those teams made it. But stepping in, doing things the way we've talked about, trying to do them for those reasons, I think you get rewarded for that. And if you go to your grave and that's your reward, then that's, that's a pretty good one. All right, we have a question in person. I was a Carlson alumni, or Carlson School of Graduate in 1992, and that's when this series started. So I wanna thank Dean uh, Sri and the deans before that for organizing these wonderful uh, monthly events. I haven't gone to a lot of them, but uh, I think they're wonderful. And today was another amazing talk. I've learned so much. Just I see why you're a great leader. So my question is, <laughs> Uh, and I worked for worked at United Healthcare too for a while. I uh, I think you were there, but your your position was so high up we never would have crossed our paths. Believe me. And also, I worked at Allianz as a consultant. So, what I'm amazed at, I've never been to one of these games. I did not know people got loony. I was intrigued. I said, Do they really do that here in that stadium? So now I want to go, based on this thing. But that's still not my question. My question is, where are you going to put? Or what are you going to do with all the people that want to park their cars? I know this area, I live here. That's a rough area. Where, what about the people from the suburbs who want to drive in? They don't want to take public transportation. There's just no place around there to park. What are you going to do about that? Um, some opinions and some facts here. 
Um, parking has never been a problem yet. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what the, the belief might be, but it's never been a problem. And you can get in and out of this stadium very quickly, I think much more rapidly than any other pro sports stadium in, in the Twin Cities. And people park on the streets around. There are some open area for parking. Um, people ride share. Obviously, there are a whole bunch of options. We have 400 um, bicycle stations. Everyone's full. Um, so we haven't faced the problem yet. We were attentive to the problem when we agreed on the stadium, and we had a commitment from the city that Governor, I mean Mayor Coleman, that they would help address the parking issues down the road. And so I trust that when we get to that and we start looking at the whole area, we will be able to address those. Ideally, I think, having worked on all these buildings and stuff, what we need is parking that can be used both by the area, the retailers, all of that, as well as the game. And that's you orchestrate. That's the ideal way, a big parking ramp just to have there. That's sort of stupid. Uh, but good urban design, I think, allows us to figure other ways to do it. And that's what we'll try for. And we have time for one last question, and that is coming from Peter. What was the biggest challenge coming from leading a Fortune 100 public company to leading a business and team that is not yet profitable? And how have you made the cultural shift to build it in a sustainable way? Um, I don't think there was, at least for me, there wasn't a challenge. Um, it's the same thing. You're, you're working in different dynamics. You're working at, you know, with different peoples and different agendas, but un underneath it all, it's the same way. You're working at, at something that you care about. You want to do well. You want to see succeed because of what it can do for other people. So whether it's a, you know, a group of 15 people on day one in 2013, or 100 now or whatever, or 150,000 uh, globally, the same issues come up. You know, the operational dynamics become different and you know, obviously you're dependent on finding more uh, good people, but you still have to have good people and you have to have people that care about what they're doing. So I don't, I don't see a difference, I, I honestly don't. I think the core of it is you have to believe in what you wanna do and, and what you're trying to do. You have to surround yourself with good people no matter whether you're large or small. You have to listen to those good people. Hopefully you can teach each other. <clears throat> As John Wooden says, surround yourself with people that'll argue with you so you just don't follow some invented path. Um, just the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.